Which many investors are playing soaring crude prices by piling into oil and commodity ETFs. Are these ETFs a good investment? Joining us now is Tom Lydon, editor of ETF Trends. We also have Dan Dick, your senior contributor to thestreet.com, and he is author of Oil's Endless Bids, which hit bid which hits shelves today. I've already read it, Dan. It's fabulous. Um, one of the main tenets of your book is that oil ETFs are at least in part to, for this big run up in oil. Explain that. Why are you blaming oil ETFs? Well, Melissa, we could argue about how much money it's actually adding to the price of the crude barrel. But what we can argue about is that every dime that goes into these, at least these future-based ETFs, is going to buy oil barrels, paper barrels of oil. We've got $50 billion in commodity ETF increase over the last 12 months. We've got $4 billion in February. I expect the same kind of a, a increase in inflows in March. Uh, bottom line is that it's driving prices up. We don't know maybe how much, but it certainly hasn't helped in this big spike that we've seen. They might be driving the prices up, but isn't it necessarily a bad thing if you're an investor? Can't you just ride it, Tom? Well, you can, absolutely. And, and there are a couple ETFs uh, to look at from a futures-based standpoint. USO has done very well, although you are paying a premium because you're you're buying the forward contract. Wait, but wait again, it's done it's, well, but it doesn't go up by the same percentage as the underlying commodity, right? Is that a problem? That Well, it's not a problem. If you look five years ago, you really didn't have any options except to buy the futures themselves or to store barrels of oil in your backyard. So today with ETFs, you do have more options. You're not going to get the pure price every day. But again, talking about what Dan was saying, I was thumbing through CFTC reports, SEC filings, academic studies, and there there is no evidence that there is speculation in the futures market that's driving up oil prices. I'm looking forward to seeing your book, Dan, but I really look forward to seeing the evidence. Well, have a read, Tom. I'll tell you this. Uh, we have the USO. You mentioned that one. That one's been one of the worst investments in the world. Oil prices are up a little bit over 36 percent last 12 months. The USO is up only 8 percent. If you really wanted a proxy for uh, the price of the crude barrel, you'd be much better off with some of the ETFs that relate to some of the stocks that are underneath. For example, the XLE, which is up 41 percent, and the OIH, which is up 36. These have been much better proxies than these future-based ETFs. And it's not just for the consumer that they've been such a problem. We have this thing in, in basically in these futures ETFs, they call it um, replication, synthetic replication. I know it sounds like something out of a Terminator movie, but in essence, what it does is it allows the bank traders to hide some of their capital requirements. Or it allows them to, to, to shirk some of their position limits. In all ways, these instruments are really a bad deal for everybody. Tom, well, you want to I, respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you look at and you see the amount of money that's gone into, let's say, USO, and and it's it's been very popular and the profitability has definitely been there, not in line with equity holdings. And XOP is my other choice today Good that one. they'll hopefully put up on the screen where you can participate not only large cap, but mid cap and small cap. I'm with you, but it's a way to hedge at the pump. And that's what's key right now is investors out there are throwing their hands up with ha having to put so much money in the tank. Dan Dicker, do you doubt that the ETFs can pay up, pay off? Are they safe? Is that part of your analysis? That is part. That's exactly right, Larry. In the end, you know, you don't know what these swap-based uh, swap based ETFs, you don't know who the counterparty is. Can you have an AIG-type person on the other end of some of these instruments? You could. Now, I don't think that something like that is going to happen, that that kind of risk is in most of these ETFs, but the possibility still remains. You could have somebody who can default and, and, and make fund holders that are holding the other end of these bets in a really sorry state. So, Tom, do you see any regulatory risk here? I mean, to what Dan was saying earlier on, if, for example, the CFTC comes in and does find that speculators are to blame for pushing up, you know, prices and the ETFs get whacked as a result, is that is that something which we do need to take account of if we want to invest in this yeah, space? Yeah, I'm, I'm living and breathing ETFs every day, and I'm always looking for a chink in the armor. But, you know, to, to this degree, this looks like a conspiracy theory to me. It's almost as bad as the $60 billion that's in gold bars and London vaults just isn't there. So if the CFTC is looking very, very closely at it and did reports and had a task force, the SEC is looking at it as well. The regular reportings as far as what's going on, I'm just not seeing it. And I hope that we can see some real, real evidence that these 
allegations are in fact true. Well, Dan, I'm not seeing it at this point. Dan Dicker, I'll give you the last word. I love a good conspiracy. Do you see one in these ETFs? Well, he t Tom talks about the GLD. This is like the perfect Ponzi scheme. You, you can basically, with a click of a mouse, take physical gold off of the market and put it into vaults. Now, that's the biggest uh, commodity ETF out there. It doesn't have some of these other roll problems like, like oil ETFs do, but in many ways, that's a real problem right there. What you're doing is you're moving out of physical product out of the marketplace and into vaults. That's making a difference in the price. All right, gentlemen, we'll leave it there. Tom, thank you very much. Dan, good luck on the book, thank buddy. You.